I was raised in a very modest and loving Dutch Reformed family. My father was a reverend and worked for the military. From a young age, I always had the sense that me and my family were supernaturally blessed. I knew that no one in this world ever deserved to be blessed by God in this manner. And so I desired to live my life in thankfulness toward God. I dedicated my life in, uh, to be a life showing thankfulness for Him being with us and blessing us in that way. One day, around the age of 10, I was cycling with my sister Naomi next to a road where the vehicles used to zip past at speeds of 70 km per hour or faster. This was still in Pretoria, where we lived until I turned 19. There was a small heap of ground near the road that I wanted to use as a ramp in order to feel myself flying through the air as I rode on my bicycle. I cycled onto the heap, but its shape and impact on my wheel was somewhat unexpected and propelled me into the road. At that moment, a bucky, a truck in American terms, was speeding exactly at that place where me and my bicycle was going to be. The bucky almost ran off the road in order to avoid me. The driver, pale because of shock, came outside. He was furious. In a rage, he expressed all kinds of profanity to explain how close to death I was on that day. I can't remember if he said he wouldn't have been able to forgive himself should he have driven into me on that day. And the sorrows of grief and regret that he would have had to bear should he have caused my death on that day. But you could see it in his eyes. At that moment, I realized two things. I caused someone to have a shock that would have been better if I did not cause that person to have that shock. And that made me sad. I don't want to cause people to have such deep feelings, um, unpleasant feelings like the, uh, that. And it was all my fault at that moment. And then secondly, I realized that I could have died on that day, but God decided to preserve me. God said, no, this day, this child is not going to die because I've got plans for, th for this child. So I did not die at the age of 10 and I'm very glad that God preserved me. And that's one of the reasons why I'm thankful. And I dedicated um, as much as I could my life to a uh, uh, God, uh, God. Obviously, we're limited by our future will, which we don't know at pre uh, present. But that doesn't mean we're not able to dedicate as much as we're able to presently. So this thought of my physical salvation stayed with me throughout my life. My father had an immense influence on me in my life. He passed away when I was only 16 years old and so I will always remember the love and the great wisdom with which he spoke. My father was quite the epic figure. He and my mother loved each other very much. Once my mother complained, I must do this, I must still do that. My mother was the love of my father's life and therefore he called her his queen. So to comfort her, he said, a queen must nothing. To let her know that she is much more important to him and to God than all the things she thinks she must do. My father used to counsel people on many matters. He was a reverend. Once there was even Muslims that asked him to come, come and be the judge between them in some of the matters of their dispute because they didn't trust the local Imam to be equal and fair. My father was able to bring peace between groups of people. People in the hospital sometimes were upset if their um, daughter died because of the husband that um, made some mistakes and then he would have to um, handle the situation. And then there was also father's sister 
and my father's br uh, uh, brother um, had some difficulties and so uh, my father was able to create peace in those circumstances and I learned a lot and I hope that I implement my father's peacemaking skills as he was very good with that. <clears throat> my father saw that I enjoyed wondering about philosophical questions and encouraged me to seek out deep thoughts and think about them. I can remember when I was about 12 years old that I decided to be quite formal and arranged for me and my father to have a conversation in our sitting room. I asked him, Father, how can we be confident in what we believe? How can we be sure of the religious fundamentals that we trust and hope in as Christians, as the Bible desires us to do? My father replied, what you are asking is a very deep question. And so it is proper for us to turn in our Bible first to hear from God before we can talk about it with better understanding. We turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. That verse says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So my father said, Here we find that the Bible teaches that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There are a lot of things we are able to see in this world, but because we are able to see them, it takes little or no faith to believe in them. There will always be some portion of everything that we need to have faith in that we will not be able to see. It is through this that we understand our confidence in them will have to be from a personal decision. I can't make that decision for you. And finding it for yourself is the only true way to have confidence in God's truths. I can only teach you what I'm able to teach you. I remembered and reflected on this conversation many times throughout my life. In 2004, my father became very sick with a form of jaundice. In Afrikaans, we call it yellow face. He suffered six months in sickness. I was somewhat creative from a very young age. I used to make many images on some computer programs we were able to have on our computer. And I took painting as an extra class in high school. While my father was sick, he asked me to bring some of my artwork to him. One of which was a um, illustration of how I thought heaven would be like. And the other one was a surrealistic image that I painted, which was somewhat weird. And even today, sometimes I'm thinking, maybe I should paint something that I would have wanted to show my father in that time frame. And so my perspective of what beauty is, um, is shaped very much by what captures the mind and gives people peace in a moment just before they would have to exchange this life with the next life. I think if you're familiar with my art, you will see something of that in that. One evening, while being sick at the hospital, my father prayed unto God, saying, I see that my life is coming to an end, but I have no peace about that matter. I want to be able to comfort my wife up to an old age and see my children grow old. I'm afraid that if I die now, there will be no one to take care of my wife and no one to take care of my children. How can I ever possibly say goodbye to them? So God replied unto my father that he would cause my mother and his four children, which includes me, to appear before him in a vision, which would then give him the opportunity to make peace, saying goodbye unto them. So he experienced that vision throughout the evening and the following day he called us all together and told us of how he saw each of us in the vision and how he said those things to us. All the things that he would have liked us to know before his departure. A few weeks after that he asked for his father and mother and his sisters and brothers to come from all over South Africa to that place. It was in order for them to have a feast. 
and so they had the feast and they celebrated his life. After we had the feast, there were two days in which my father grew critically ill and he passed away. His body could not handle the sickness flowing in his blood anymore. While he died, my mother sat next to him and sang old hymns to comfort him while he was going to heaven. In high school, I became good friends with some Christians. Because I was in the Dutch Reformed Church, I would have called them liberal Christians. I thought the Dutch Reformed way of Christianity was more conservative. Back then, the internet was still a very unfamiliar and scary thing, which only privileged people used extensively. I had no idea how other denominations worked, or at least not properly. So being amongst these friends of mine, I would sometimes tell them that they should believe in infant baptism like me and my family, and believe in theistic evolution like me and my family. Fortunately though, at some point, they were able to provide me with the seven-part seminar series of Kent Hovind, which helped me a lot with regards to understanding the creationist worldview, which I then adopted. However, I remained believing in infant baptism, and so why did I continue believing infant baptism? I told them I don't understand why we would have to keep such a common part of Christianity away from young children. I can never see myself discriminating based on age in this manner. And so that was my type of thinking back then. And so I remained an infant baptizer because I considered it a more fair view towards the young children. To know why this is somewhat flawed, you can do a word search on the word baptism on any Bible program and just read through the verses related to baptism and I think you will get a rough idea where the problems come in with regards to that. After school, I went to the University of Pretoria and studied visual communication, which include art history and other theory-based subjects. I then became frustrated with my subjects and the hostel I lived in. I wasn't used to living far away from home in the hostel type environment. Not hostile, hostel type environment. And I realized that as a person I would prefer subjects like maths and science and practical art. There, I was busy studying a theoretical th thing. There was no problem solving specifically on the subjects I was busy with. Struggling at the pressures, I dropped out of university and spent a lot of my time writing a fictional novel about a Romeo and a Juliet type character suffering under the evil race of genetically modified humans. So this novel was basically me trying to create secular entertainment for other people. During this time frame, some of my friends started following some popular websites with regards to Christian apologetics, uh, some of which believed in the Big Bang Theory. Um, I was surprised by this um, and unfortunately I couldn't agree with that theological view. Um, later on, these apologetic websites also included Calvinism, which after my um, later repentance, which I'm going to talk about soon, was something I also could not accept. And so at the end of that year, which was my first year after school, me and my mother and my two sisters traveled back to Cape Town and we started living in this part of South Africa again. We originally lived here in the Western Cape, but we went up to Pretoria for my father's work. All my mother's family was here in the Western Cape, so it just made sense for us to move this way. In this time, I felt completely hopeless and useless because I was a sinner and had no truly good plans for the future. I considered myself only fit for rebuke. One day, I walked to the top of one of the Tigerberg Hills and looked over the Western Cape, seeing thousands of houses, buildings and cars filled with unsaved people who didn't know Jesus as their savior. I could remember Kent Hovind saying that in life you should either be saving souls or helping other people to save souls in some way. Here I was, wasting my life. And the God who made the beautiful mountains and the nature of the Western Cape, which I was able to see at that moment, 
and all the unsafe people in those buildings, which I was looking at, died for us on the cross without any of us ever deserving it. I started crying and I started singing from the fullness of my breast a hymn called Sus die klein die hand van die pottenbakker which translated to English the words of the song are like this As the clay is in the hands of the pot maker so am I in the hand of the Lord as the clay is in the hands of the pot maker, so am I in the hand of the Lord. For me, Lord God, for me, and make me even if it feels sore. For me, Lord God, you alone know how you want me to be. So in that time frame, my older sister Naomi was visiting from Pretoria, and she helped me by driving me around from one academy college to the next to check out the courses they had for me to study. It was still at the beginning of 2008. So we gathered all those pamphlets together and I went through all the courses they had available and I finally decided on print production and design at a college which was in Belleville. So at this college we had two days of class and then we had our first year's camp. In our first days of class we basically learned how to use Microsoft Word which was almost redundant to me because I already did about two courses previously with regards to Microsoft Word so I was thinking wow is this perhaps something useless have I decided to study the wrong thing so that demotivated me somewhat but later on through the year st things started making more sense and they started teaching us things that were more useful at that point though I was somewhat concerned. So we went on the first year's camp and on the first evening they had some music in the hall. We were in a place where there were places to sleep and there was a hall where they decided to have a musical artist presenting some modern songs and singing over there. So most of the young students were listening to the music and clapping their hands and yelling and being very excited on that side but for some reason I wasn't really interested in that and I was reading my Bible. The Bible I was reading at that time frame was an NIV equivalent. I didn't know of any better relatively speaking even though I've watched the video series of Kent Hovind in which he mentioned the Bible version issue but I didn't think it was that important. And so the portion of scripture I was busy with really touched my heart. I thought, wow, this portion of scripture is special. And I felt that, wow, I need to share this message with somebody else. And that's the reason why God wrote it. He wanted it to be given to the world. It was not just me that was supposed to receive the message. So I saw there were some other people also sitting there at the beds, not attending to the music in the hall. And so I walked to those people and I told them, hey, I have a Bible verse. Can I read it to you? And they said, okay. And I read it to them. But I quickly realized that the Bible didn't have that much value to them that it had to me. And I learned something that day that some people just don't click. They don't click with regards to the Bible, Bible's value. And later on, I learned that these people were professing Christians. So that's something sad about life. And I think there's an opportunity for us to show people how valuable the Bible is, how interesting it is, and how much growth you can find in it. So the following morning at the camp, we were waiting in groups for instructions. And while waiting over there, God gave me a surprise. I saw two young men talking about the Bible and the book of Revelation. They were talking about the gifts that God would give to those who would overcome. And I realized these gifts are amazing and that I haven't studied these gifts in the Bible yet. For some reasons I have seen portions of the book of Revelation but I haven't really gone through and thoroughly studied the book of Revelation 
and I realized that there was more truths in the Bible that God wanted us to think about. So I started studying some prophetic books in the Old Testament, mainly the book of Daniel, because I realized if I wanted to read the book of Revelation, I would have need of some prophetic context and some of the symbols are explained in the Old Testament. So I had some background as to how the Bible is put together. I knew that Revelation would use some of the symbols that are earlier throughout the Bible. The symbology was very interesting. I tried to illustrate them with a pencil in some of my books. Some of the images were quite crazy, but I realized that God was way bigger and deeper than I expected and that there were very great difficult supernatural things that I have not encountered and thought about throughout my life. And so this is one of the reasons why I fell into Pentecostalism at that point in time because I thought that's the way where the Bible was leading me. So I tried to follow the Bible as far as I could. And so I became interested in the supernatural th things in the Bible and things that I did not understand yet as a Dutch Reformed person. I also discovered a book about Bible topics placed very deeply in one of our cupboards. And that book was actually very helpful. It had so much scripture for each and every topic it was about. So I just started eating up scripture and all those topics actually covered some of the topics that I thought were very intense, some demonology, even an angelology, and um, also how to fast and so forth. And that became a um, very good place for me to start studying the Bible. And so I started eating those words that were in my Bible. I became good friends with the, these people and we asked the college if we could have a classroom that we can use to do our Bible studies. And so during break times at the college, we would come together. The place's name was Prestige Academy and we would discuss the Bible in those time frames. And it was pleasant. Up until then, I never regarded a personal day of repentance and belief as an event which would bring forth regeneration because of salvation. In the Dutch Reformed Church, we have never truly been taught something specifically like uh, that um, from a sermon from the pulpit. I think the preachers all thought that that would be too Arminian, even though they might have actually considered it orthodox because there was a sense of evangelical Christianity in the Dutch Reformed Church. They would distribute chick tracts because the chick tracts wouldn't specifically say you need to be baptized as an adult. So um, that's why uh, they would allow distributing those things. So they had this evangelical component, but at the same time there was this Calvinistic non-evangelical theme going on and there, depending on which where you are in the Dutch Reformed Church will determine how your views are on these things. I think the non-evangelical Calvinism was practiced more by the hardcore theologians in the Dutch Reformed Church, especially in South Africa, while the ones that just want to build a relationship with their congregation, they're open for some more evangelical views with regards to that. I sometimes prayed in my prayers something like this. If you would like me to pray a sinner's prayer, Lord, show me a sign because I would not like to show disrespect by performing an act of appropriation which you have not ordained. So I was very firm about if prayer and repentance is not an act of appropriation which God has not ordained, then it would be sin for me to use that as a means of appropriating salvation for myself. Well, in fact, I think I should have just been more natural about it. Because when you come to an epiphany and a big realization about God and you want to 
transform something in your life by means of taking on the salvation that God gave, then you can pray. You can do have your great rep uh, repentance. Who cares what happens in your moment of appropriation? There is a degree to which our faith is expressive and somewhat mystic. And so because of that revelation that I got in that time frame, I became quite mystic and became quite Pentecostal. And that's basically the tension that there is in South Africa. On the one side, you've got these people that um, are completely against all forms of mysticism. And then you've got these people that are constantly m uh, mystic. So you've got the Pentecostalists on the one side and the Dutch reform on the other side. And there's no in between in this country um, for most denominations. So that's definitely something that you can pray about for South Africa. And it's a deep concern for me also. And so I desire to help people see how the Bible is and the teaching nature of the Bible and the beautiful foundation that we have in the Bible for making sense of this world and a lot of topics that the Bible actually discuss. There's really a lot of books that clarify these issues that are actually difficult to find in South Africa. You will have great difficulty finding any books about dispensationalism in South Africa. It's just not popular on this side. Fortunately, these new friends that I made at the first year's camp, they were actually interested in those topics. And so they um, started teaching me some of those issues while we had our Bible studies in that classroom that we had at the college, Prestige Academy. And so one day, Ulrich told Monre about some of the experiences that he had. Also remember that these friends of mine were Pentecostal and that was a denomination in which I was basically going over to in that time frame. In spite of that, Monroy was a very wise person and he was very informed with regards to scripture. Ulrich, one of the friends, was explaining one day unto Monroy how he was a sword fighter in a previous life. And so Monroy said, well, unfortunately that's not scriptural and he just got this feeling that the Holy Spirit was talking to him as Monroy at that moment. So he felt that he received an inspired word to give unto Ulrich. So we walked to the room that we used during the break times and Monroy started talk, uh, talking to Ulrich saying to him that God wants him to know that this is not what God teaches and here and here is the Bible verse with regards to that and that even though Ulrich made a mistake God still loves him very much and that God will work in his heart and that God will use him and make a great preacher of him and so while Monroy was giving this beautiful message unto Ulrich I was praying and I was praying that God would comfort Ulrich and encourage him and show him that God has a good pl a plan for him. And so while Monroy was talking, he suddenly had a feeling and he said, he thinks God also wants to talk to me. Uh, me. So, and so he said, okay. And he said, there's something that God th thinks I have not do uh, done yet. And so me and Ulrich said, okay, well, um, Hendrik has not been baptized ye uh, yet. And so Monre said, no, he doesn't think it's uh, that. And so he asked me, Hendrik, have you ever received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior? And so I said, ah, I've practically only always ever believed. I haven't had a specific day of receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal savior. And so he said, well, believing is a very good idea. That just sounds very weird to him. He, he thinks it will be a good idea for um, me to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal savior on that day. And so I said, okay, yes, let's do it. Let's do the, uh, that now. And so he explained the go uh, gospel and he um, said a sinner's prayer and I repeated it after him. And I think that was a very good exercise. And I think all of us should do that once in our life. I think the odds are good that if you haven't done it yet, the message haven't struck home with you yet. Because salvation is a definite event in your life. 
and receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior should be a from darkness to light type of experience and that's basically what happened after that for me I um, started fasting more I started spending more time with poor people and I was able to conquer my addiction to pornography and I got over a lot of things and um, I also got baptized and I also started studying the word much more um, I was a Pentecostalist for five years and then I realized that there were problems in the Pentecostal worldview and I started um, studying the King James Bible in 2014 I went over to the Baptists and I've been a Baptist ever since so it's six or seven years now I've been a Baptist for about six or seven years the heart of the matter is actually that I love God and I'm thankful that Jesus died for me on the cross and if Jesus didn't die for me on the cross my sins would still be upon my flesh and when I would stand before God then God would have doomed me justly for my sins I did not deserve his salvation but Jesus died for me on the cross anyway Jesus loved me that much that he said it's worth it so he died for Hendrik de Beer and that's who I am he died for me he died for me and I will ever be thankful for what he did for, for me and I have an opportunity to share this good news with other people and I desire for the hearts and circumstances in which people live to be revived and I pray that God will heal my land and the whole world where the gospel goes so I pray for God to work in this time frame and I will always be thankful for my salvation because <laughs> there's no way I could have cleaned myself I was a dirty sinner and only God healed me and I want that for other people I want that for you whoever you may be if you don't have Jesus you need Jesus Jesus is the healer he heals your sins and without that healing there's only death and I don't want that for you so please receive the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior and let his Holy Spirit work in you and that's that basically was the biggest discovery for me was the working of the Holy Spirit because by discovering the Holy Spirit I realized where the power comes from to have victory over your personal sins and the struggles that we have as Christians without the Holy Spirit it's impossible to have victory but with the Holy Spirit victory is in sight I hope this video blessed you I hope you will feel and see the Holy Spirit work in your life because he's there he's part of the Trinity you serve a wonderful father wonderful son and a wonderful spirit may it go well Amen.